Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. I'm Becky Worley, and this is the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovator Series. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com forward slash challenge. And by MailRoute. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. One user to 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. When you talk about electric vehicles, there's one company that's revolutionized the idea that these cars could be cool as well as green, Tesla. They've sold 1,500 of their Roadsters, which is impressive given the more than $100,000 price tag, and the company is expanding to produce a sedan. They have 2,000 orders for the new Model S that they plan to deliver in 2012. I got a chance to talk to one of Tesla's founders, J.B. Straubel, and test drive the outrageously speedy Roadster. For too long, people have thought of electric vehicles as something out in the future or something an environmentalist drives to support their beliefs. Well, the Tesla Roadster is here now, and this car is sexy, and it's making the company a profit. What's Tesla doing? What's your mission here? So Tesla's mission is to convert transportation to run on electricity. And that's, that's the simplest you know, way to say it, but we're trying to avoid using oil and, and use uh, electricity or kilowatt hours instead. How did you get involved in this? Uh, this has been something I've been passionate about my whole career. I was you know, one of the early founders and part of the founding team of the company and had been converting golf carts and cars since I was a kid. So. People think of electric cars as being utility vehicles, glorified golf carts. That ain't no golf cart. These are definitely not utility cars. One of the goals we had was to change the perceptions of what EVs could be. And you know, when we started out, EVs were commonly seen as a golf cart, as something slow and you know, kind of a punishment car that you had to drive to be really green. And you know, we've worked very hard to make sure that you know, we built cars that were you know, really fun, great driving characteristics, something you'd love to be in just because of the, the way it drove. Who are some of the early adopters who are driving Teslas? It's an interesting mix of early customers. Um, generally, it's people that are very well educated about the environment, uh, people that are you know, very savvy about the impact you know, that their activities, their choices make on the environment. Uh, there are technology early adopters, uh, people that uh, you know, really want to you know, do something you know, green with their, their choices, their personal choices. And uh, it's turning out to be a, a stronger market force than I think a lot of companies and, and people have anticipated. Why is that? Um, Possibly because you know, the, the population at large, I think, is really beginning to, to realize and wake up to, to you know, the, the damage that they're doing to the environment, maybe faster than the companies were in their choice of what products they were offering. Uh, and Tesla was a little bit ahead in offering products that you know, had no compromises and let you, you know, be very green um, and make a choice that was green, but also wasn't you know, you know, uh, sort of this you know, ultra-compromised, you know, very small, very boxy kind of car. Do you have anybody who buys these cars who doesn't give a rip about the environment? There are some of those customers, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting mix because some people are transitioning out of a Prius, other people are transitioning out of a turbo Porsche. And um, you know, we absolutely have some customers that just buy the car and drive it just because it's so much fun. It's really fast. Give me 15 seconds of car and driver describing this car. Um, this car is you know, almost frighteningly quick. Uh, the torque is extremely smooth and consistent. Uh, it accelerates more like a, a jet airplane on takeoff than a normal uh, sports car because uh, there's no lags or surges. Uh, it's very easy to drive. Uh, there's a gas pedal and a brake pedal, so almost any you know buddy that gets in the car, even for the first time, can you know achieve these zero to sixty numbers that are you know 
you know, in the marketing literature. You don't need to be a race car driver in the perfect conditions in order to do that. Is Tesla only going to make cars for the green elite? Absolutely not. Um, you know, the, the mission we have is to get as many miles being driven on the road to become electric as possible. And you know, the way to do that is through you know, getting more electric vehicles you know, in greater numbers on the road, not just by making a better you know, car for the, the technology elite or the green elite. So our core mission is to drive down the cost of the core technology so that it can be adopted in a wider uh, market set. For a lot of people, the barrier to entry is the initial cost of the car. But in the future, as you're looking at sedans and family cars, mm -hmm. you see this as being sort of amortized over the long haul. Describe mm -hmm. that in layman's terms if you were trying to sell a family of four on this car or on this S. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing to focus on when you look at the cost of the sedan is, is perhaps the comparison of monthly operating cost. You know, if you look at a leased sedan, and, you know, plus your fuel cost or your electricity cost, the cost of the sedan is very comparable to a you know, really run-of-the-mill sedan. It's not that much more than the monthly operating cost of something like a Ford Taurus. So I think that's the way that customers are, are beginning to view these, these vehicles when they look at, you know, wow, I'm spending you know, hundreds of dollars a month on gasoline. And that's, that's very much a real part of operating a normal car, whereas with an electric car you might spend tens of dollars a month on electricity. Another you know, aspect of EVs is that the service costs can be much, much lower. Um, we don't have oil changes. Um, because we have regenerative braking, we don't wear out brake pads, we don't wear out brake discs as much. Um, you know, the tires tend to go pretty quickly on the Roadster, but uh, a lot of the other service items you know, last a very long time. The, the Roadster really isn't a golf cart. It's something that can offer you know, no compromises to a customer that wants the very most efficient car on the road, but also wants something fun to drive. You, know, you can have something that's twice as efficient as a Prius, but also as much fun to drive as a Porsche. And there's absolutely no, no other car on the road that offers that set of attributes without the compromise. How do electric vehicles fit into the big picture of fighting global warming? Well, electric vehicles address uh, transportation energy use. And if you look at the breakdown of where CO2 is coming from and energy use is going, you know, transportation is one of the, the biggest wedges. And uh, it's a very difficult wedge to address because it's totally dominated by petroleum right now. So electric vehicles offer a way to uh, transition transportation from burning completely oil to using electricity, which can be supplied by you know, green technologies such as wind or solar or things that don't uh, encompass any CO2 at all. Is it really here today? Yeah, well, I actually absolutely do think it's here today. Uh, you know, the, the differences between OPEC and, and extraction of oil as a natural resource and the manufacturing of batteries or motors or things like that, it's a very different type of, of industry. Uh, you know, the, the constraints on batteries right now are really production capacity, and that's something that, you know, can be grown fairly quickly. But with oil, you have a finite supply of a natural resource. Um, batteries are, can also be recycled, and we see that already happening in internal combustion cars. Lead-acid batteries are almost 100% recycled, so it's, it doesn't end up being a net drain on natural resources. It's just a manufacturing uh, cycle that gets created. Is there a limit on lithium supply? Lithium actually is one of the, the smallest constraints. Lithium, you know, the cost of lithium is less than 1% of the battery today. And, you know, there's a number of different studies on lithium availability, but it actually happens to be one of the more common elements in seawater. And if the, the cost of lithium comes up just a, a little bit, there will be a lot more economic sources of extraction. You know, we focus more on some elements like uh, um, copper, um, aluminum, nickel, some of those things in the battery pack and the motors and wires that we keep closer track of. How close is battery technology to being as good as it gets? Are these things maxed out? Batteries definitely aren't maxed out in their capacity. They can get a lot better. Uh, there's a lot of improvements on the roadmap that, that we're seeing for manufacturers. It's part of why we're investing so much time, effort into pure electric vehicles because you know, we see that in five, ten years time, batteries could be twice as good as they are today, enabling cars with you know, half the battery size or weight, uh, twice the range or half the cost. You know, those improvements can lead to many benefits. But isn't that a catch-22? You can't ramp up production until prices go down. It, it definitely is a catch-22 in some regards, and it's part of why you know, we've worked on unique strategies with the battery pack, working with the manufacturers that are today in the very highest volumes, um, so that the costs are as low as they possibly can be, you know, even at the relatively low volumes that we're building EVs today. What's it going to take to get us to a completely electric transportation system? A completely electric system um, won't require any massive 
technology revolutions from where we are today. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is a proper accounting of the total cost of oil and burning oil. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory challenges around really understanding what does it truly cost all of society to burn a gallon of oil. Um, you know, when you start to compare that on a total cost basis with electricity and the cost of generating the electricity, I think uh, you know people will make you know more intelligent decisions. But you know, eventually we'll we'll need cheaper batteries. We'll need you know larger battery manufacturing capacity. But these things are, are evolutionary. They're not something where we see a you know invention needed here and it has to get inserted in the process. You're an inventor, probably a tinkerer at heart. If you were making the calls about how to change where we get electricity from, how we do it. I mean, electricity is core to your business, so I know yeah. you've had these thoughts. What would you do differently? Well, I'm, I'm most excited, I think, about uh, solar energy. I think that's the one that has, if you really look at the ability to scale to a, a level that can meet 100% of our needs you know, someday and transition the whole society to renewable energy. Uh, you know, wind is the lowest cost right now, but solar has an ability to scale like none of the others do. And uh, to me, that's you know, where uh, you know, we should be focusing a lot of our efforts and in, you know, intense invention efforts and innovation efforts is in solar. There are practical considerations when you're thinking about an alternative fuel car. How do you mitigate those with people who are, who are skeptical? Well, infrastructure is a challenge with any alternative fuel, as, as you suggest. Um, electricity, I think, has the benefit of having the, the most pervasive infrastructure already in place. Um, the part where that needs to get augmented is in between cities, where people want to take a, a very long trip from you know, a Los Angeles to a San Francisco or from a, you know, New York to Boston or something where you, you're going a long way between different city centers. And there's a number of startup companies, electric utilities, governments that are starting to realize that problem and attack it with different business models. And you know, I think as we see the density of electric cars increase in the market, those solutions will, will follow because there is a business opportunity there and people will take advantage of it. So I test drove an early electric car, funky design, three wheels, and somebody stops me at a light and says, are you from the moon? And I felt so self-conscious that it really put me off electric cars. But for today's EVs, do they have to look space age? We haven't gotten the are you from the moon comment with the Roadster, but it's one of the things we, we really wanted to change was that, that perception. And some customers love that, but it's a, it's a little bit smaller market niche. And with the Roadster, we, we wanted desperately to make a car that was going to you know, change perceptions, be something that was you know, uh, uh, better than, than every other car on the road without the compromises, without having to you know, look like a bubble car or feel like you're, you're a missionary for you know, green technology. Um, but you know, just you're having fun, you have a great car, it looks sexy, so. I know this is a startup company but you have such a small piece of the car market, and yet you've gotten a lot of attention, and obviously Tesla's important in some way. Why? Well, I think Tesla is able to lead by you know, delivering cars to a very influential and very um, you know, unique set of customers that are thought leaders in their fields and, and in the world. And you know, even with uh, you know, around 1,000 cars on the market, uh, you know, I think we've been able to affect a, a mental transition in a huge way, bigger than uh, you know, many of the OEMs have done with, with many, many different cars. And some of the proof of that can be in looking at recent auto shows. You know, the Frankfurt Motor Show in 2009 um, you know, it was almost the Frankfurt Electric Vehicle Show. You know, every, ve every manufacturer had an electric vehicle concept or prototype and you, know, you, saw, you almost weren't in the party if you didn't have an electric vehicle. So that's unheard of as of a few years ago and um, you know, I, we don't want to take too much credit for it, but I think the Roadster had a large part in, in moving mental perception, moving people's idea of how viable electric uh, technology is uh, to the forefront. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the U.S., one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster.
GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners. Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. One user to 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. MailRoute is a secure, hosted service that filters virus and spam from companies of any size. There's nothing easier for mail filtering than MailRoute. There's no hardware or software to install. You just sign up with MailRoute to start your mail flowing through them, and then they do all the work for you. Visit MailRoute.info to sign up. As a TWIT listener, you'll receive a 10% discount for the life of your account. Small business accounts start at $2 per user per month for 10 users, and because of demand from the TWIT army, MailRoute has added a new service for individual users as well. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom and Leo use. This is a car that's plugged in and it's incredibly easy to unplug it, plug it in. This is you know, how we charge it. So it just takes a second to plug it in, flip the switch. Um, and it'll start charging automatically and fill itself up. What does the station entail? I mean, I had visions of the orange Home Depot cord coming out to the car. <laughs> we have a bunch of different ways to, to plug in and different connectors. Uh, this is one that's just a little bit more convenient to hold the cord on your wall, but mm. we also have portable cords that you can take with you and plug into any outlet. It's even the 120 volt, just normal extension cords if you want. Hmm. Cool, all right. And uh, we can pop the trunk maybe and look in the back here. Whoa. Very so, back to the future. Yeah, it's uh, okay. It's Those little, would be batteries. This is the battery pack. There's not much to it. It's a, a big black box and you're kind of looking at the engine compartment of the car. So now do these get hot? Um, not much that you'd really notice it. Everything runs at a lot lower temperature. You know, we don't have an exhaust, you don't have catalytic converters and all those things. So um, that lets us put everything in kind of in plain touch. So you know, I think since the um, laptop started blowing up on people's mm -hmm. um, desks, they got a little freaked out about batteries. Uh, these may be the same people who don't recognize they're driving around with a flammable substance in the form of gasoline, but batteries in the car, should it freak anybody out? Um, I certainly don't think so. You know, we've, we've done an enormous amount of safety work testing on battery packs, and you know, part of the key is that uh, this whole battery pack, even though it's pretty big and heavy, is only carrying the energy equivalent of about two gallons of gasoline. So, you know, if you think of it that way, you've got this little teeny gas tank in a, in a car, you know, versus an SUV that might be carrying 30 gallons of gasoline. So the, the total, you know, energy capability, even if, you know, you, you know, pour it on the ground and lit on fire or something, is, is very much lower. So it's a lot more benign, even if you're, you know, in some kind of crash. Do I hear liquid? Yeah, the batteries are liquid cooled, actually. It's part of our uh, pretty uh, intensive cooling system to keep everything, you know, very uh, even in temperature. So you do hear a little bit of liquid coolant that circulates through the battery pack when it's charging right. and driving. Cool. Excellent. Um, you know, inside the car, it's, uh, this is a new one, so everything's covered in plastic, but... Uh, Let's see. I've got to check. Does it have that new car smell? Mm, nice. Mm-hmm. Um, it passes on that uh, on that area, definitely, and it just ooh solid, solid. I like it. Um, up front, there's not too much. We have the air conditioning systems, heat, but there's a few radiators up front to take the heat away from the battery pack and, mm. and uh, the cabin. Mm -hmm. um, Sweet. All right, let's just keep touring around, sure. see what we see. Um, are there, how many different models do you have? Uh, only, well, we have a, a Roadster Sport version that has a little bit faster 0 to 60 even than the, the base car. It's about mm -hmm. 3.75 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, the European version of the Roadster that has a little bit different markings and things like that. Probably none of these have that, but. Mm -hmm. And they're all sports cars? Um, well, no, we also have a sedan, the Tesla Model S, that's uh, in development right now, and we have a few prototypes, but it's uh, coming to market in uh, late 2011, so uh, just about two years. When you say sedan, I mean, there are multiple ways to think about this. Are yeah. we talking about 
BMW 7 Series or are we talking about Buicks? Uh, this is a sports luxury sedan. So it's a, a kind of in between a BMW 5 and 7 Series. Uh, it's a you know, five passenger plus two car with two seats, uh, folding seats, jump seats in the rear. Uh, so it's a, it's a big car. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot of utility there. It has more storage capacity than almost any sedan on the market. Uh, and it's a very much different you know, vehicle fight type of feel than this car. Hmm. All right. Um, um, and what will that cost? So uh, the, the base price of that car will be about uh, $49,000 after the, the uh, federal tax credit. Um, so it's about half the price of the Roadster. And you know, we'll be building it in much higher volume and uh, are investing you know, in a lot of technologies to reduce the cost of the battery pack and the powertrain to, to hit that price point. Got it. Cool. All right. Um, maybe we can look at the one that's uh, taken apart a little bit if you mm. want to see what it sure. looks like with the wheels off. Are they all convertibles? Um, they are, although we have a, a hard top. I don't know anything about cars. So what would I see differently if this were a standard gasoline car? Um, well, some of the things you're looking at here wouldn't be too different. You know, this is, you know, the brake and the suspension system. That's about the same. But, um, you know, inside this, you know, the back of this car is where the battery pack, you know, goes in this car. There's no exhaust. That's one obvious thing that you notice right, right away. Um, and, uh, you know, th those are probably the biggest changes is, you know, lack of any exhaust and a different powertrain. And these don't have that regenerative braking? They do, but it's incorporated into the motor. So, so the, the friction brakes here don't change at all. Uh, okay. Got you it. just don't need to use them as much. Hmm. All right. Um, what else should we look at? What else is cool to see? Uh, this is a battery pack. Okay. That I didn't cool. even know it was here, but you can see it now. It looks like an old rear projection TV. I mean, it's, it's a big hunk of metal. It's a big black box. It's not very exciting on the outside, but uh, this is where all the energy is stored. This is what delivers all the power in the car. So this is probably the biggest different piece in an EV from a regular uh, gasoline car. How much does this weigh? It's about a thousand pounds. Ooh. Um, wow. So even though this thing is so big and heavy, uh, you know, the rest of the powertrain, the electric motor and the, the gearbox end up being quite a bit smaller. So the overall weight difference between an EV and a gasoline car uh, is actually very small with a lithium ion battery. Um, it's just a larger fraction of the weight and the volume is taken up by kind of your fuel tank, essentially. Got it. Do all, car, do all electric car manufacturers use lithium ion technology? Um, no, uh, it's, it's becoming more of the standard, uh, but still some people are looking into nickel metal hydride batteries and, and uh, there's even some people still looking at lead acid batteries, but I think over time, uh, people will begin to migrate more completely toward lithium ion. It's the technology that lets you store the most energy in a given amount of weight and volume. So that equates to, our, to more range in the vehicle and, and also more performance. Well, have a good test drive. Wow, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. For anyone who thought electric vehicles couldn't get decent range or serious performance, let me tell you, these things are for real. Hey, thanks for watching. If you have any comments on the show or anything for the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovator Series, email us, greentechtoday at twit.tv.